Rachel from Soyless Books, welcome back to my channel. Technically, there's still two and a half days left of the month when I'm filming this, but I really needed to get it filmed and I really don't think I'm going to actually finish any more books. So, just because this weekend, I am partying. The month of October has been a really awesome month. I had so much fun doing all of the things. Do you ever like look back and think, how in the hell did I do all of those things? Yeah, that's me right now. Not only was it booktube events and reading challenges and video challenges, but also my life just went kind of crazy. Also, just emotionally, it's been like seven months since I have not had a single break from my kids. And like, that's not a bad thing. I've really enjoyed having them home. Now they're gone and my husband has gotten back to work and he's gone for two weeks. And it's like, this is weird. <laughs> that's been an adjustment for me. <laughs> But anyways, there goes my monthly wrap up of my life. Let's go ahead and get into everything that I read. First, for some quick stats, I read eight books and partial of House of Leaves. For the most part, I stuck to my TBR that I mentioned in my October TBR video. I had a couple of books overlap, several challenges, which proved to be challenging when I DNF that book. But I did okay subbing in a different book for that. So. For the Dark Academics Book Club, there were two books for this month. I read both of them. The first one is We Have Always Lived in the Castle by Shirley Jackson. I gave this one 3.5 stars. I actually really enjoyed this one. It's a classic gothic short story and it was a really quick read. It's basically about this dinner party who got poisoned except for this one girl and there's all this speculation about like who's responsible and how come she didn't get poisoned. This girl like becomes a pariah. I just really love plot lines where poison is involved. I don't know why. It's just so scary to me because it's so sneaky and it could be anything. There's so many different things that can be used as toxins. I think like in Turn of the Key, that was one of my absolute favorite parts of Turn of the Key was the poison garden. And I wish in that book we had gotten more of that. But anyways, we're not talking about that book. Then I read Phantom of the Opera by Gaston LaRue. It's really hard to categorize this book to a specific genre. It takes place in this actual, a real actual um, famous opera house in Paris. It's about this like phantom who haunts the opera house and haunts the main act the main act of woman. And there's all of these like strange things that keep happening. Honestly, I'm really terrible at explaining this plot and I feel like some of the things I keep thinking about explaining about this book, I'm like, you don't wanna know that. But I think most people know what it's about anyways. I really enjoyed it. It truly is as Emmy, who's also one of the hosts for the Dark Academics Book Club says, she says it's a comedy, a horror, a romance, and just all of the things. I listened to this one on audiobook but I think that I really needed to read the physical edition. I really feel like I keep saying that a lot lately. I think it's really because I, so when, back when I was like devouring audiobooks, I was working out of my garage and I would just go on autopilot. I didn't have distractions. I wasn't like, I could just completely get immersed in it. And I just feel like maybe the activities that I have to do all the time require a lot of brain power. And so it's become difficult to actually focus on the audiobook. So I miss things. I also think maybe I'm not always choosing the best books. Like I keep choosing more complicated plot lines that uh, are probably better suited for the physical book. Anyways, the first half of it was great. But as I kind of started getting towards the end, I started like losing track of some of our characters, uh, what they were doing, some of the integral conversations that they were having. I would like only get half of what they were saying. So I definitely want to do a reread of this book. For the Hocus Pocus readathon, I did very well. This one was a month long readathon that you are part of a team that you read for points that go towards your team. I was on Team Sanderson Sisters and I have earned the team 84 points. The group book for this is Mooncakes. It is about a witch who reconciles with an old friend who happens to be a shifter. Now I don't know if she's just considered a shifter or a werewolf, but she shifts into a wolf. She also helps her solve a problem of this like scary monster phantom thing that's like chasing her and haunting her. It was really good. 
I think the best thing was the illustrations. I love that style of illustrations. I felt that it was well paced and it drew out the plot nicely with character development. And it had really interesting characters. However, I feel like the conflict to romance ratio was kind of off and it really made it feel like the whole purpose of this book was just to write an LGBTQ romance. And I felt like it overshadowed everything else. So I gave this book three stars because it was still good and it, you know, I really liked our characters. I was rooting for them and their relationship, but I just kind of got bored with their drama and I would have liked more of the witchy aspect and more of her best friend. Her best friend was really fun and bubbly and I just really liked spending more time with her because their drama was kind of a downer. I mean, it was good, but it was just like... I don't know. For Sarah's book, so for the Sanderson sisters, each prompt is based on the witches on the Sanderson sisters. For Sarah's book, you're supposed to pick a book based on sisters. And I chose Practical Magic by Alice Hoffman. I think that this book ended up being a perfect pick for Sarah's book because of the tone and the whimsical, playful, lyrical writing style. I was initially nervous about going into this book because I, I was worried that it would either be too much like the movie and I would be bored or it'd be way too different and screw everything up in my mind of my expectations and ultimately enjoy ruin my enjoyment of this book. Thankfully, neither of those things happened. Um, it was definitely very different from the movie, but I loved seeing how they changed the movie from the book. And I can still enjoy the movie and the book as separate entities. For one thing about the book, that wasn't in the movies, I really enjoyed getting to know Sally's daughters. In the movies, you only see them as like little girls and then they kind of disappear or something while they are going through the crux of the conflict in the movie. But uh, that doesn't happen in here. You actually get to see the girls grow up as teenagers and um, wow, <laughs> teenagers, just saying. <laughs> However, I really missed the ants. I didn't care for the ants in the book as much as I liked them in the movie. I felt like it really kind of changed their personality because the ants in the movie were very like warm and fun and like mysterious. They were into all the witchy stuff uh, and they were just, they were just really kind of lighthearted fun. But in here, they're just rather cold and uncaring and they just disappear. They're like not even part of the book. They're actually, they're talked about quite a bit, but they're just, yeah. I think the best part of this book, however, because there was some parts that were kind of bogging me down and I kind of just in my mind was like, okay, I want to read this book. I want to finish this book. I'm a little bit bored with what's going on, but I really enjoyed the writing and so I would like really just kind of ride the wave of the really lyrical and whimsical writing. The supernatural aspect of the witches in this book, it was very, the witches are more like, I would say like real witches. Uh, there's less supernatural. It's more based on feelings. Our main characters don't really believe in it at all. It all came from their aunts, but however, they still grew up with certain things and things are weird. Nothing is really that supernatural. And I think I was wanting a little bit more of that. That was more of my expectations. I also really like all types of witchy stories and I like the ones that are more relatable to uh, people who practice witchcraft in real life. However, regarding the writing, as whimsical and as playful as this was, there was a couple instances where I was very um, taken aback, where our author used quite crude language to talk about a couple different things. I just felt like it was quite odd choice and it kind of broke up that whimsy feel. And then again, one of the other things I didn't care for as much as it did get a little bit slowed down in there somewhere. Next up for Winifred's book was to pick a book with powerful witches. I'd originally chose Vasa in the Night. I was so excited about this book and I liked that it was pretty small, um, but I ended up DNFing this book. And I'll talk about that later. I have another video planned where I'm gonna talk about all the books that I have DNF'd over the year. So I will talk about this one later. But I replaced this prompt with The Chilling Adventures of Sabrina and this was so good. This is a TV show as well and I have watched a few episodes of this show. Basically it's Sabrina the Teenage Witch, but horror. 
and I loved it and I love the story and the illustrations are not the greatest like the cover is really beautiful but like as I go through the book which I'm actually reading it on ebook through Hoopla uh, I love their platform for reading graphic novels really enjoying this and I definitely want to continue the series and I want to get back into watching the TV series as well I'm not really sure exactly what to say about this except um it's creepy, it's gory, uh, there's some scenes that are really kind of scary with like eyeballs popping out, like it's kind of like your, oh, I don't know the terminology, like cult classic that are almost kind of cheesy in a way as it goes with the feel and it's just great, I love it. For Mary's book, a book with an evil character. I don't have a dust jacket for this, uh, but that is Interview with the Vampire. This is my first Anne Rice book ever. And it was definitely high time as I keep saying how much I love vampire stuff and I've never read some of the most popular of the genre. So it was high time that I read this and man am I glad that I did. I wish I had read this a long time ago. I loved this book. Honestly, do I need to explain this one very much? I will do it very quickly. It's just that interview with the vampire. This vampire goes, I think it takes place in the 80s. Yeah, 80s. Uh, Louis tracks down this young man and offers an interview about what it is to be a vampire, his life story. So he goes back to the moment he was changed when, when Lestat finds him and transforms him into a vampire. Back in, God, what was it, 1700s? So for decades they go around together until they add another to their like little coven, uh, a child, Claudia. Lestat loves to be a vampire. It's his favorite thing in the whole world. He also relishes in being cruel. This guy is pretty damn evil. He is a loose cannon, he is wild, and he's complicated. As a human, Louis was followed him and accepted his offer because he was so charmed by him, this beautiful vampire, but he was looking at him through human eyes. And once he becomes a vampire and he can see truly, he changes his mind about him. And so he lives decades hating his lot, hating Lestat. A very tortured existence Louis lives and he spends a lot of time contemplating his life, contemplating the choices that he has to make to survive, contemplating his existence as a vampire. How are, how is it that vampires can exist? This book was just so amazing and so good and I was just shocked. Honestly, I really was not expecting such an atmospheric, so gothic, and it really reads like a classic. Atmospheric, it's horror, and I really enjoyed the writing. It's pretty flowery and descriptive, despite being, I felt that it was really tight writing, like a lot happens in a short amount of time, and they still managed to get all those juicy descriptions in there. So I really liked that balance. Well, there's a lot of things that I annotated in this book where I was like, I just love the way Anne Rice describes this. And it's so rich and lush and description. But I think I'm just gonna read the one thing because I think that it's really funny because people kind of make fun of, for real, hear this passage. My annotation next to this was, has a sunrise ever been so beautifully written? It's completely haunting and not cheesy. Some people are so good at this, okay? Like, I just have to call out Emmy because she does a lot of reading passages that she finds interesting and she's just like the perfect intonation when she reads and so I'm trying to channel my inner Emmy. My last sunrise, said the vampire. That morning, I was not yet a vampire and I saw my last sunrise. I remember it completely, yet I do not think I remember any other sunrise before it. I remember the light came first to the tops of the French windows, a paling behind the lace curtains, and then a gleam growing brighter and brighter in patches among the leaves of the trees. Finally, the sun came through the windows themselves, and the lace lay in shadows on the stone floor and all over the form of my sister, who was still sleeping, shadows of lace on the shawl over her shoulders and head. As soon as she was warm, she pushed the shawl away without awakening. And then the sun shone full on her eyes and she tightened her eyelids. Then it was gleaming on the table where she rested her head on her arms and gleaming, blazing in the water in the pitcher. 
and I could feel it on my hands, on the counterpane, and then on my face. I lay in the bed thinking about all the things the vampire had told me, and then it was that I said goodbye to the sunrise and went out to become a vampire. It was the last sunrise. I don't know, I just really liked it. That's that. <laughs> Needless to say, I gave this book five stars. I wanted to pick up the second book straight away, and it was, well, it was not the same at all. Just the opening, okay? Where is it? So this is the copy that I have. I'm only on the sixth page. It starts on page three. So I made it for two pages, and I was like, what the fuck is this? This is not the gothic, beautiful, horror that I wanted and anticipated and fell in love with. This is just not the same. And I don't think that this is a spoiler because literally you will find out within two pages. It went from this lush, dark, scary monsters who hide in the dark to 80s famous rock star. After that two pages, I went to look at reviews to be like, what is this? Is Am I alone in thinking that this is like crap? That just, what, what happened? But a lot of people were like, this book changed their life and this is amazing. And I'm like, okay, maybe I'll go back to it one day. I, I kind of have to. So like, do I continue reading? Please let me know, I'm so torn. For Spooktober, we get to make our own Halloween party. This was such a fun idea. So my costume is a fantasy costume, which now I look like a Hufflepuff, but I'm a Ravenclaw. The book for this, party choice is to read a fantasy book. So I picked Miss Peregrine's Home for Peculiar Children by Ransom Riggs. I think I'm gonna take the hood off because it's very, it's hard to stay up. Anyways, I don't know how people do it. Do they like glue it to their head? There has to be a way to get those to stay on because it's constantly slipping off. I am really sad to say that I think I'm too old for this book. Not really the story, I like the story. And the book is amazing in aesthetic value with all of the cool ooky pictures and the chapter page plates. I want more beautifully crafted books like this in adult fiction too. Why can't adults have picture books too? It was just kind of hard to get into it because the writing just felt very young. Much for the same reason I couldn't get into the Percy Jackson series. It's just kind of like the way, the way the story is crafted, kind of like, I don't know. It's just, I just find it really sad that I didn't read these books when I was younger. Cause I just feel like something like the writing style wouldn't have bothered me or I probably wouldn't have noticed it if I had been able to enjoy these books when I was younger. But now that I'm older, it's like, again, I didn't explain the plot to this. Uh, so basically, and I don't actually know if I need to, I think most people are familiar with it, but just in case. It's about an ordinary kid who grows up with his grandfather's stories of these peculiar children. He comes to terms with the fact that all they are are just stories, they're make-believe, until he finds a time loop and all the children from his grandfather's stories are true. And there's a lot more to the story that I really like as well regarding our young friend here. So for refreshments, we've got a candy bowl. Oh my gosh, I haven't had these in like forever and they just smell like Halloween. This is literally all the candy I have in my house right now. And if we kept candy around the house, it'd be gone. The only reason I have this candy is because I hid it, but I really wanted it to take Instagram photos and I never got around to taking those photos. Oh my God, it's been years since I've had candy corn. Wow, sweet. I mostly picked a candy bowl because I just wanted something short, short and sweet. <laughs> so I ended up reading a Goosebumps book paired. Where is that book? My son Aaron and I read The Deadly Experiments of Dr. Eek. Okay, so this was a choose your own adventure and our story didn't last that long, uh, but it was really fun. And I just, I love these books because you can just keep reading them over and over and try to choose different things and different combinations of things. Like I know I was talking about younger writing. This is obviously gonna have a little bit younger writing, but for some reason, it's just different. On the dance floor, we are gonna play Superstition. For this one, I had picked Vasa in the Night as well. Again, I had to, I actually didn't replace this book. I ended up missing it. So not doing too bad though, still considering the festivities we are gonna play on a Ouija board. So the book for this one, and I don't have a Ouija board to pull out, unfortunately, 
because that would have been really cool for the purposes of this video. But the prompt for this one was to choose a book that people warned you about, and that is definitely House of Leaves. I've been warned that this book is terrifying, even if things do not make you freaked out. Uh, I'm feeling it already. I'm all, I know I'm only like 70 pages in it, but like there is some freaky ass shit going on in this book. I'm spooked. Uh, this book I have not finished. This is not a good book to pick for a readathon or like there's a, a big bunch of pages that have like one word on it. So I was like, okay, like this looks huge, but it's not gonna take that long to get through. However, it still takes a long time to get through just because there's like a lot to unpack. So I'm not finished with this book, but I think that it still counts that I started it. I spent time with this book and that totally counts. And then for the Because We Can Readathon that I participated in, this was actually a last minute readathon that I threw into the mix because I forgot that this one was happening, honestly, till the end. The, the primary highlight for this really for me was all the video challenges. And it was like, I will leave the playlist that I created of all the video challenges. I did manage to make a video for all of those prompts, plus the book tag they created for the event. So I will leave all that information in the description box below. It was so much fun. There were also reading challenges and I had chosen House of Leaves, uh, that book, House of Leaves, and I chose Vasa in the Night, which I DNF'd that book. I didn't finish that book. The Beautiful by Renee Audier. So this is about a girl who has a sordid secret past. She chooses to go away and escape her past and find a new start to her life. So she moves to, so she moves into a convent in New Orleans. And no, it's not to become a nun. But she lives there with, uh, I forgot how many other girls, six or eight other girls. And the nuns keep them on a strict leash and the girls serve, serve them, serve the nuns until they can find a suitable gentleman to marry. This takes place in 1872. So obviously we have a much different, you can see where that fits in, how women would need to not live alone, things like that. Um, much different past for women. So Celine, our main character, she manages to charm a young, beautiful, rebellious, rich socialite who gets her to design a dress for her for this event. But people are turning up brutally murdered. Now I think it's well known that this is a vampire novel. Uh, I think a lot of people have said that the vampires really don't show up until the end. That's actually not the experience that I had with this book because you have this like dual perspective going on. On one hand, it's Celine telling the story. And then on the other hand, it's this like creepy, dark, mysterious, guy that is stalking the streets and obviously has a vendetta against somebody who has wronged him. I really loved this book because it has, it is a YA novel, but it has a subtlety to the writing and the progression of the plot and the progression of the characters and unraveling who they are and what their secrets are that I really just have a hard time finding in YA. So that was really refreshing. Just just the storytelling of it. Everything was just written so well. I loved the characters and I love the subtlety of the feminist. This is a bit of a feminist book. How do you even say that? There's discussions that bring in that feminist, that make this a feminist book, but it's very subtle and it's appropriate for this time period. As in, while we are highlighting these social issues and conformities that women are obligated to, to do or to abide by, there's these discussions of their feelings of why they have to have a man. I think Celine specifically is like, why am I nothing until I have a man? And that's very powerful. <sighs> and as I said, because of this time period, it's real and it's believable which I'm very happy to see. There has been a few books that really try to be feminist books, but women would not act that way. Recently, I am just irritated by books that try to be feminist, but taking it to an unrealistic degree, such as not being appropriate for the period. And for instance, our female character, who's the rebellious feminist character, decides to start beating everybody up around her. Like, why do you have to beat people to a pulp to, to prove that point and prove that they're strong and independent? Like that does not sit well with me or completely swear off men. That's not exactly the point of being feminist either. So 
that bugs me. <laughs> so in this book, I like that the discussions were more about having a choice. And while they can't help the world and the expectations that they are held under, they rebel in their own little ways. For one girl chooses to marry because it's her choice to secure a future for herself. And the man that she chooses is basically, I guess she's not in love with him or anything like that, um, but she feels like he is a good man and he'll treat her well and give her the life that she wants. She won't have to fear for her future. While the other girl really can't settle, she doesn't see herself being able to settle like that for security's sake. Her spirit is rebellious, but it's subtle. She's not mouthing off per se, but she will say little things and catch herself and be like, oops, but you can feel it, like the, the tension and her emotions, but she's still proper, she's still a lady. She's just upset by things, you know? Things, things kind of just bug her. So she's subtle in the way she uses her quick wit. And while there's still even another woman in here who's very free-spirited and our main character comments on that and she's almost kind of shocked about it but intrigued by it and it kind of brings out her wild side that she probably wouldn't dare go to that length but she's intrigued by it and she accepts this other woman for who she is and she accepts her friend for who she is and she doesn't cut them down because of their choices and I really liked that you are who you are I am who I am and she is who she is without being condescending without being detrimental and I loved all the personalities all the personalities were just so distinct so the creepy side of this book I had already mentioned the other perspective so we have Celine's perspective and the creepy predator perspective and it is seriously creepy this is an amazing book I listened to this one on audiobook the narrator is Lauren, Lauren, Lauren Ezzo. And I was absolutely enamored and seducted by her voice. It was so perfect for this book, but sometimes a little bit too dramatic when no excessive drama was really necessary. I'm so sorry. It was just a bit too cringe sometimes at some moments that were like highly intense from the narrator's tone. It did, so it did take some effort to just kind of realize that if I had actually read this in the physical edition or in the physical format, I would not have dramatized those moments. And so I wouldn't have found those moments to be cringy. But again, her voice is so beautiful and she does such a great wide range of characters so well. Like she does the creepy man voice. She does a seductive woman. She does the the woman who's holding back and nervous and she does the like sweet innocent girl like she does all the roles so great and i would really like to listen to more of this narrator's audiobooks anyways so that's all the books that i read i didn't watch as many like spooky movies as i wanted to this month i've been just been way too busy so i think we, i have this weekend planned the 30th and the 31st, Friday, Saturday, my kids and I are gonna have our own like Halloween party.
that wraps up my October reading and life and stuff. If you like this video, go ahead and leave a comment, subscribe, leave a like, whatever. Thank you so much for watching. Bye.